Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Ever wonder how the Supreme Court really became supreme? The decisions of Chief Justice John Marshall in the early 19th century did much to strengthen the judicial branch of government in the United States and to define that three-branch arrangement that is so basic to the American system of government. The John Marshall Foundation was founded in 1987 in Richmond, Virginia, by a group of dedicated lawyers, the Virginia Bar Association, and Preservation Virginia, all so that we could learn more about this great Chief Justice. Go to their website, johnmarshallfoundation.org, to learn more about Marshall's landmark court decisions, his many civic contributions, and his family life in Richmond. Teachers and lifelong learners like us will find a wealth of resources at johnmarshallfoundation.org, including articles, books, videos, and other materials for classroom use. To learn more, visit johnmarshallfoundation.org. February 24th, 1803. In the case of Marbury versus Madison, I, John Marshall, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, shall read the majority opinion. The question whether an act repugnant to the Constitution can become the law of the land is a question deeply interesting to the United States, but happily not of an intricacy proportioned to its interest. It seems only necessary to recognize certain principles, supposed to have been long and well established, to decide it. That the people have an original right to establish for their future government such principles as, in their opinion, shall most conduce to their own happiness, is the basis on which the whole American fabric has been erected. This original and supreme will organizes the government and assigns to different departments their respective powers. It may either stop there or establish certain limits not to be transcended by those departments. Certainly, All those who have framed written constitutions contemplate them as forming the fundamental and paramount law of the nation, and consequently the theory of every such government must be that an act of the legislature repugnant to the Constitution is void. This theory is essentially attached to a written constitution and is consequently to be considered by this court as one of the fundamental principles of our society. It is not, therefore, to be lost sight of in the further consideration of the subject. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present-day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Welcome to episode 210 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. John Marshall. For 34 years, John Marshall presided as the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. And during his service, Marshall transformed the nation's top court and its judicial branch into the powerful body and co-equal branch of government we know them as today. Now, you've been asking for episodes about Marshall and the Supreme Court. So as we plan this Doing History biography series, the Omohundro Institute's digital projects team and I decided that we would use Marshall as one of our examples of biography. And this seemed really fitting to us because John Marshall was also a biographer. Now, as you heard in episode 209, John Marshall wrote one of the first biographies of George Washington, a five-volume work that our guest Scott Casper noted stands as more of a Federalist history of the United States than it does as a biography. And it stands as more of a history than a biography because of Marshall's goals. Marshall wanted to tell the history of the United States through George Washington's eyes. He didn't actually want to detail the life of George Washington. And this difference is important. Just as our three guests in episode 209 related, the difference between a work of history and a work of historical biography comes down to the goals of the author. Does the author want to tell the story of an individual life? Or do they want to chart the development of a movement, idea, community, event, or trend over time? Goals are also important within the genre of biography. When historians and biographers choose to research and write about the life of someone, they usually have a really good reason for doing it. There's just something about the person that they choose as their subject that they want us to know about. 
That's why we're going to spend the next two episodes exploring two different biographies of John Marshall. Not only will the two episodes tell you about different aspects of Marshall's life, they'll also show you how different scholars can look at the same historical sources and take away different ideas and stories from them. In this episode, we're going to meet with Joel Richard Paul. Joel is a professor of law at the University of California, Hastings Law School. He's an expert in law and how it developed within the United States. And he's also the author of Without Precedent, Chief Justice John Marshall and His Times. Now, during our conversation, Joel will reveal why he chose to research and write a biography about John Marshall, details about Marshall's early life and how he came to serve as the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, and how Marshall was able to transform the Supreme Court and the judicial branch of government into a co-equal branch of government with the executive and legislative branches. But first, have you checked out all the great bonus content for this series in the OI Reader? My Omohundro Institute Digital Projects team teammate, Joseph Edelman, has commissioned blog posts by historians, editors, and biographers, all to help you explore different aspects and views of biography. And Holly White and Kim Foley have been hard at work updating the OI Reader app so that you can easily access all of these blog posts, plus bibliographies citing the works that we use to write this series and the biographies that our guests suggested as great examples of the genre. The OI Reader app is free and is available for all Android and iOS devices. So visit your favorite app store or visit benfranklinsworld.com slash OI Reader. Okay, are you ready to explore the life of John Marshall and how one of his biographers wrote about his life? Allow me to introduce you to our guest historian. It is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Those who apply the rule to particular cases must of necessity expound and interpret that rule. If two laws conflict with each other, the courts must decide on the operation of each. So, if a law be in opposition to the Constitution, if both the law and the Constitution apply to a particular case conformably to the law, disregarding the Constitution, or conformably to the Constitution, disregarding the law, the court must determine which of these conflicting rules governs the case. This is of the essence of judicial duty. Our guest is a professor of law at the University of California Hastings Law School in San Francisco. He's an expert in constitutional law, international economic law, and foreign relations law. He's the author of four books, including Unlikely Allies, How a Merchant, a Playwright, and a Spy Saved the American Revolution, and, most recently, Without Precedent, Chief Justice John Marshall and His Times. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Joel Richard Paul. Thank you very much. Now, in my experience, there is always a great story behind what brings an author to write a biography about someone. So, Joel, I wonder if we could start our conversation with your story. How did you come to write a biography about John Marshall? Sure. Well, I've been teaching international and constitutional law now for about 30 years, and it's hard to teach those subjects and not to appreciate the enormous contributions that John Marshall made to both fields. He really laid the foundation stones in both international law as it's construed by U.S. courts as well as U.S. constitutional law. And I've come to believe that there really is no one in the founding generation who had a more enduring influence in what the nation has become, both in terms of our government and in terms of our legal system, than John Marshall. So it was sort of natural that I would want to look into how this fellow who had very little social standing, came from a very poor background, how he was able to have such an enormous influence on the shape of our nation. So Joel, you're a legal scholar, a lawyer, and a historian, which means you could have approached your study of John Marshall's influences on American law through a traditional history book. Why did you choose to write a biography? Sure. Well, you know, my way of thinking law is a kind of result of social phenomenon. It is really a kind of an artifact of how a society develops in a particular period of time. And I was particularly interested in the 
kinds of forces that shaped John Marshall, the choices that he made at particular points in his life. I also thought, just in terms of a narrative structure, that I think that a narrative structure is a great way to reach a larger audience. It's a way that people who may not necessarily have an interest in law or in legal history as such can get involved in it. And part of my mission as a scholar is really to get more people interested in history and to care more about the ways in which history has shaped our nation. There really is something about the stories of people's lives that connects us with the past and history, isn't there? Yes, that's right. There is a way in which by focusing, I think, on the ways in which individuals live their lives, we have an appreciation not just for their individual contributions to, in this case, our legal system, but also we learn a lot more about the society itself, about the ways in which people went about their daily lives, about how the economy was organized, about the relations between men and women. And all of that interests me as well. I also want to emphasize, though, that what I was trying to do in this book wasn't really to talk just or primarily about John Marshall's contributions to our legal system. But I wanted also to give people a broader appreciation for his contributions as a statesman, as a diplomat, secretary of state, because he was such an enormously influential figure in his time. And he probably did more than anyone in the early days of our republic to secure our place in the world, to keep us out of war with various European powers that threatened us. And all of those kinds of contributions, I thought, also needed to be recognized and understood. You know, that's a great point. And it's a perfect place for us to transition our conversation into the details of Marshall's life so that we can better understand his important contributions to the United States. Joel, where does the story of John Marshall begin? Jeff wonders if you would tell us about his early life and about his service in the Revolutionary War. So John Marshall, unlike all of the other great figures in Virginia at that time, was born into a very modest family. He lived on the western frontier of Virginia in approximately a place called Germantown. His father was a surveyor and a farmer. He shared a two-room log cabin with his 14 brothers and sisters. And they really sort of eked out a living in that sort of hard scrabble frontier. And he basically had no formal education apart from a single year of grammar school. He was almost entirely self-taught. His parents taught him to read, and his father borrowed books so that Marshall would have something to read. And Marshall, when he was 19, he volunteered to join the 3rd Virginia Regiment to fight in the Revolution. He went to the first drill in Germantown of this sort of local militia. And the captain who was supposed to arrive to drill the troops didn't show up. And so this 19-year-old kid said, well, you know, I'll run the drill. And he literally starts drilling his neighbors and very quickly asserts his leadership in this regiment and eventually becomes a lieutenant and a captain and joins the Fauquier Rifles which was a group of uh, sharpshooters during the revolution. He fought in a number of very critical battles during the revolution. And the one that shaped him the most was the Great Bridge Battle in Norfolk, Virginia, where the British basically devastated the city of Norfolk, which at that time was the largest city in Virginia, the largest and most important state in the country. Marshall witnessed this and it really had a, an effect. It shaped the way that he saw society. I think it demonstrated for him in a very vivid way the fragility of our society and the need for strong national defense. And then he went on to serve at Valley Forge during that terrible winter when all these men were suffering such deprivations. Marshall's innate good cheer, his sense of humor, his resilience really stuck out among all of the other men. And so Washington took notice of him and the Prussian 
General Baron von Steuben, who, by the way, was neither a baron nor, in fact, a Prussian general, but that's another story. Steuben took Marshall under wing, and he became a very close associate. Eventually, he rose to become Judge Advocate General of the Army. He hadn't even gone to school at that point. He had no legal background. And he was a real standout among the young men of his time. And the experience also in the Revolutionary Army shaped him in that he saw the failure of the state system, the Articles of Confederation, simply did not provide adequately for a military. Marshall saw then the need for a strong national government to provide for our security. These experiences shaped his conservatism. It shaped his view about what the nation needed, and I think also contributed eventually to shaping his views about the Constitution. Marshall's political career is something we definitely want to cover. But before we explore that aspect of his life, you raised a really interesting point, and I wonder if you would elaborate on it. How did Marshall's military service really shape his politics? I mean, how did Marshall come to see the world of American politics through his military career? The military taught Marshall that you need to have a strong national government, that that is the sine qua non for nationhood, for sovereignty, that the state system simply didn't work. He realized in the military that you needed to have more integration among the states, that some of the squabbles between the states, the sense that you know one state was better than another, that these things did not contribute at all to the national defense. And so he became more cosmopolitan. He became more of a nationalist than a Virginian. And he rejected parochialism. He rejected the provincialism that so many of the other Virginians shared. And I think that was of fundamental importance in much of his jurisprudence, where he really sought to try to find ways to integrate the national economy and to strengthen not just the national government with regard to defense, but also with regard to the regulation of the economy. This sense that we are one nation, indivisible, was born out of his experience in the military. You mentioned that while Marshall served in the military, he came to serve as the judge advocate general of the army, and that he served in that role without any formal legal training. But Marshall would take a break from his military service, return home to Virginia, and get some formal legal training at William & Mary. So I wonder if you would tell us what law school was like during the late 18th century and what kind of training Marshall would have received. Well, you know, it was quite different than it is today, of course. First of all, the legal profession was not professionalized in the way that it is today. People went to law school in part as a kind of liberal arts education. It was for many of the men who went to law school or who had legal training, either in Virginia at William and Mary, which was the first law school in America, or in Britain, which was more typical of the sort of upper classes in Virginia. They had this legal education, not because they intended to become attorneys, but because it was a way of equipping them to be gentlemen, members of the gentry class, the people who were served in the Virginia House of Delegates, for example. And the bar in Virginia was divided in that there were those people who were educated in England and were members of Inns of Court in London. And there were about 60 or so men who had gone to England in the previous decade, who'd gotten their education there and then came back to Virginia. And those people really were from the upper class. And then there were also those people who would be admitted through the general court, first in Williamsburg and later in Richmond, which was a process in which the top tier of society could ensure that they would be admitted into the bar. So this was just for the elite of the elite. And then there were those who would get some kind of legal training, either as apprentices or going to law school and be examined for the bar. Marshall was in that latter category, which was sort of like the lower tier of the bar. When Marshall went to William and Mary, it was, as I said, the first law school in America. And he studied under George Wythe, who was the chancellor. And Wythe was 
an enormously influential figure. Many of the great figures in the Virginia bar had studied with him, including James Madison. And with would have lectures and the students were basically expected to take almost verbatim type notes and be able to sort of spew back whatever he told them. And the texts for those courses were primarily Blackstone's Commentaries on the Law, which had been published in America just a few years earlier, and which Marshall had already read as a young man. And also, they relied on Matthew Bacon's New Abridgment of the Law. So these were basically books about British common law. They were not books about Virginia law. They would read these books and then they would be expected to sort of memorize the things in the books. They also read Montesquieu and they read David Hume. And it was a pretty dry kind of education. Once a month, George Wythe would lead his students to the other side of town to the old assembly which had been abandoned when the assembly moved to Richmond. And in the old assembly room, he would have them perform either a moot court or a moot session of the legislature, basically to sort of train them in oral skills. That was sort of the general curriculum there. Marshall was only a student there for six weeks. And his principal reason, it appears, for going to law school was not because he really intended to become an attorney or a political figure so much as he was in pursuit of a young woman, Polly Ambler, whose family lived in Williamsburg at that time. And he wanted an excuse for hanging around and seeing her and also gaining the kind of social status that he thought would make him an acceptable suitor for her because she came from a much more upper class family. So he was there for six weeks listening to these lectures. And after six weeks, Polly Ambler's family decided to move to the new capital in Richmond. And when they did so, Marshall promptly exited. He quit his studies and moved to Richmond with them. Now, Marshall did pass his Virginia bar examination and he became a practicing lawyer in Richmond. Joel, what can you tell us about Marshall's law practice and his time as a lawyer? Well, in those days, lawyers were not specialists the way they are today. So he was really a generalist. He would do anything that walked in the door. If it was a will or an estate situation, he would argue civil cases, he argued criminal cases, he would have to travel to courts in other towns. So it was a very varied kind of a legal experience. And the bar, of course, was much smaller than the bar would be today. There were relatively few men in the bar. And Marshall was an exceptionally intelligent, gregarious, outgoing, very eloquent advocate. So in a matter of just a few years, he really had distinguished himself, despite his lack of social standing and the fact that he sort of dressed very casually and his manner was very casual and kind of sloppy. People were very impressed with him. And so Marshall quickly began to acquire as clients some of the most prominent men in Virginia, including George Washington, and his income from his law practice rose accordingly. But Marshall, like other men of his time, they practiced alone. They didn't have associates. They didn't have partners. They didn't have secretaries or support staffs. They didn't have access to much of a library. Uh, He had a few books on Virginia law. He primarily relied on Blackstone and a few other books that he had acquired, Vettel. But he wasn't particularly well-educated in the law. He was instead just a highly intelligent person who wrote beautifully and who had great speaking skills and proved very persuasive. John Marshall practiced law, and he also practiced politics. And Mark would like to know why Marshall entered politics and what he advocated for. Yes. So his experience as a politician was almost uh, kind of accidental. Initially, after Marshall moved to Richmond and quit law school and wanted to set up his own law practice, the revolution was still going on and everything was more or less in chaos. And it really wasn't a very good time to try to set up a law practice. He didn't have clients. And so he thought, well, 
you know, I'll run for a legislative seat because as a legislator, he could have an excuse for being in Richmond and hopefully impressing Polly Ambler's father, who was also in the Virginia government. And it just gave him an excuse to meet people and make contacts and hopefully set up his law practice eventually. So he went to the legislature as a kind of way of preparing himself for his eventual law practice while the economy was still in disarray. He very quickly impressed people, though, in the legislature, and he was the youngest man ever appointed to the executive council in Virginia. It really sort of put a number of people's noses out of joint that they had sort of jumped over more senior figures to award this young man with this position running what was the highest council in the state government. Marshall in the legislature felt strongly that Virginia needed to liberalize their laws with regard to manumission, that is to say, to make it easier for slaveholders to emancipate their slaves voluntarily. So he worked on that issue. He also worked to make it possible for free black citizens to be recognized as citizens of Virginia at a time when only whites were allowed to be citizens of the state. So those were sort of two big issues he worked on. But probably the most significant event for him was his election to the Convention for the Ratification of the Federal Constitution. Yeah, it does seem to me like Marshall was in many ways a founding father who isn't always recognized as a founding father because he didn't attend the Philadelphia Convention to draft the Constitution, but he proved vital for its ratification in Virginia. So would you tell us about Marshall's role at the Virginia Ratifying Convention and how he was this founder, but not a founder? Marshall was probably more important than many of the men we think of as founders of our Constitution. Because at the Virginia Ratification Convention, it was far from clear that Virginia was prepared to ratify the Constitution. After all, Virginia was the largest state, the most important state in the Union. Virginia didn't need the rest of the country. The rest of the country needed Virginia. And the leadership for the fight to ratify the Constitution fell to James Madison, who had written the first draft of the Constitution and who really was, in many ways, the intellectual father of our Constitution. But Madison, for all of his brilliance, was not a politician. He was a very dour figure. He had a kind of oversized head and a squeaky voice, and he was very, he was sort of a hypochondriac. He was always falling ill. And he just couldn't persuade anyone on his own. Marshall, on the other hand, was a much more outgoing, gregarious guy. He told great stories. He had a wonderful sense of humor. He was very eloquent. He was a very powerful speaker. And so Marshall took on a critical role in the ratification debates in Virginia. He would take the men out for drinks at his uh, favorite tavern, and he would tell funny stories, and he sort of worked on the delegates one by one. And this was really important because ultimately the Constitution was ratified in Virginia by 10 votes, by 10 votes out of hundreds. And had it not been for Marshall's persuasiveness, his intellectual as well as his personal charm, I don't think the Constitution would have been ratified. And without Virginia, we would not have had a nation. So his role as a founding father was very significant. Also, much of the speeches he gave in the ratification debates were significant in themselves because he talks there about, for example, the authority of the Supreme Court to strike down legislation that was unconstitutional. In effect, he anticipated the decision that he wrote most famously in Marbury versus Madison, establishing or confirming the authority of the court of judicial review. It's really interesting to me that your description of Marshall is almost one of a natural politician, because when I read your biography without precedent, it really seemed to me that Marshall was uncomfortable with politics. For example, he ran for office. And then after the ratifying convention, George Washington asked him to serve as the U.S. attorney for Virginia, and he said no. Then Washington goes back to Marshall and he asks him to run for Congress. And Marshall said no, but then reluctantly says yes. And even after that, 
John Adams offered him the position of Secretary of War and Marshall declined. Then Adams goes back to Marshall and offers him the position of Secretary of State and Marshall accepts it, but again, very reluctantly. So I wonder if you would talk to us about why you think Marshall seemed to take on public office only with great reluctance. Good question. Marshall, unlike many other men and women in politics, really had no taste for power. He didn't lust after power or fame even. He entered politics, I think, because he felt strong loyalty to George Washington. Washington was sort of a father figure for Marshall, and we could sort of get into the psychology of that because Marshall seemed to always attach himself to strong older male figures. And Marshall was really shaped by Washington in the military. And so Washington called Marshall to his home in Mount Vernon after Washington had retired from the presidency. And Washington asked him to run for Congress. And Marshall said, no, I have no interest in running for Congress. And Washington kept hammering at him. And after several days, Marshall tried to literally escape one early morning from Mount Vernon before Washington woke up. And Washington confronted him in the stable and basically said to him, look, you know, I made sacrifices for our country. You have to make some sacrifices too. And so Marshall reluctantly runs for Congress. He runs for Congress. He gets swept in because he's a very popular figure. And once he gets elected to Congress, he almost immediately becomes the leader of the Federalist Party in a single term in the House. So these opportunities fell on him. And because he was so highly regarded by so many people, he just couldn't say no. And eventually, when John Adams offers him the position as Secretary of State, Marshall doesn't really want the job, but Adams desperately needs him to be Secretary of State. And Marshall thinks that this is a good way to get out of Congress because he figures, if I take the job as Secretary of State, then at the end of Adams' term, I can have an excuse to leave Washington and go home to my wife and kids in Virginia. But of course, it doesn't work out that way. This is a little funny to me because Marshall was looking at the position of Secretary of State as an escape from political office. But so many others would come to look at that position as a stepping stone to the White House. But perhaps Marshall served just before people started looking at Secretary of State as a gateway to the presidency. Well, no, actually, at the time, the Secretary of State's job was regarded as a step to the presidency. In fact, Jefferson had been Secretary of State. Madison became Secretary of State after Marshall. I mean, these people saw the job definitely as a stepping stone to the presidency, but Marshall didn't. Marshall saw it as, as a way out of Congress. Of course, Marshall's plan worked. He did get out of Congress, and he didn't use Secretary of State as a stepping stone to the White House, but he did use it as a stepping stone to the Chief Justiceship of the United States Supreme Court. Now, do we know why John Adams thought that Marshall would make a good Chief Justice and why he tapped him for that job in 1801? There's sort of two answers to that question. One answer is because he didn't have anybody else. And the other answer is because Marshall was and remained a very loyal Federalist. But what happened in the election of 1800, which I'm sure your listeners are well aware, when Jefferson took over the presidency, it was really a kind of cataclysmic event. It was something which really shook people up. Many people, of course, were elated that Jefferson had been elected president. Many people feared Jefferson's election. I would say the reactions to Jefferson's election were not unlike the reactions that many people had waking up the morning after the election in 2016, when you know some people felt that something really terrible had happened. This was a revolutionary, disruptive figure that Jefferson represented. And he was someone who had taken sides with the French Revolution at a time when the official policy of the United States was one of neutrality. He was someone who had never supported the Constitution and the national government. And people in the Federalist Party were terrified of him. And so Adams is trying desperately to try to create some kind of a bulwark against the spread of Jeffersonian republicanism. And that bulwark included trying to put people on the court who would defend Federalist ideals. He offers the job to John Jay, and John Jay, who had been the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, turns it down because it's a terrible job. Nobody wants this job. The Supreme Court has no authority. 
the Supreme Court doesn't have any interesting cases. There's very small docket, about six cases a year. The court was a nothing institution. It basically heard admiralty cases. And as a member of the Supreme Court, you had to ride circuit, which literally meant getting on a horse and riding around the country, hearing cases and taverns and, you know, staying in inns where you had to share a bed with a stranger. I mean, it was not a prestigious job. So he offers the job to John Jay. John Jay says no. It's a few weeks before Jefferson is about to take office. In desperation, John Adams turns to his Secretary of State, John Marshall, and says, you've got to take this job. You owe this to the country. And Marshall, who does not want this job and who has promised his wife repeatedly he'll come home to Virginia, reluctantly agrees to take the job because he too feels strongly about defending Federalist values. And he knows better than most people just how dangerous Thomas Jefferson is because Jefferson is his second cousin and he hates Jefferson as much as Jefferson hates him. I definitely want us to talk about the Jefferson Marshall relationship. But first, you said something curious, that the Supreme Court was nothing, that the chief justiceship was not a prestigious or sought after position in the government. And this is totally the opposite of what most of us would think today. We happen to see the Supreme Court as a co-equal branch of government. So I wonder, how did the executive and legislative branches develop into these powerhouses of government while the Supreme Court lagged behind during these early years of the United States? Well, in the early years, the way that Congress had set things up, basically the Supreme Court heard primarily admiralty cases. They were mostly cases which were coming up from the district courts involving disputes about you know, ships being taken as prizes of war, piracy, damage to goods, things that were not all that interesting. The members of the court themselves were not particularly distinguished. They basically had only about six cases a year that they heard. They would meet for a month in the winter and a month in the late spring. Nobody really enjoyed writing circuit. And there were no court reporters. The public had no interest in what the court was doing. There was no way to sort of find out what the court was up to. So the court was just kind of a forgotten branch of government. When the planners of the capital city planned out the new buildings in Washington, D.C., they forgot to build a courthouse. And when John Marshall met with the court for the first time in February 1801, They had to scramble to find a committee room on the ground floor of the Senate that the Senate reluctantly agreed to let them share with the district court and the court of appeals. And so that was the home of the Supreme Court. It was basically a small, nondescript, unimportant committee room. And that pretty much represented the way that most people thought about the Supreme Court before John Marshall. Now, just to go back to the point you made about the animosity between John Marshall and Thomas Jefferson, Ruth and Kate would really like to know more about the relationship and rivalry, because it is clear that whenever you read a biography about Marshall or a biography about Jefferson, that these two men didn't like each other. So why didn't John Marshall and Thomas Jefferson get along? It was both personal and political. Basically, John Marshall's grandmother was a Randolph. The Randolphs were the Brahmins of Virginia. They were the highest caste in Virginia. His grandmother had grown up at Tuckahoe, which was the largest, most famous plantation in the state. They had hundreds of slaves. She'd grown up in the lap of luxury. But his grandmother was a wild woman. And his grandmother ran off with a slave overseer. And her brothers chased after her found him and killed him and possibly also killed her infant child. And the result was his grandmother basically lost her mind. She was disinherited from the family. She was basically excommunicated from the family. And Marshall and his family did not inherit any of the wealth that would have otherwise come to them from the Randolphs. Instead, Peter Randolph decided that he would appoint as his executor for the family estate at Tuckahoe, the father of Thomas Jefferson. And Jefferson's father moved his family into Tuckahoe. So literally, Jefferson, who was Marshall's second cousin on his mother's side, grew up with this enormous wealth and power and privilege 
and social status that was denied to Marshall. Jefferson always looked down on Marshall. He saw Marshall as kind of his poor cousin, uneducated, somebody who didn't have the kind of style and finesse and grace that Jefferson represented. It's ironic because Jefferson presented himself as a Republican, as a man of the people, of a common man, and Marshall took sides with the elite as a Federalist, as somebody who believed in commerce, who believed in urbanization, who believed in trying to knit the country closer together. And so their political philosophies were sort of opposite to their actual social stations. And Marshall, I think, felt particularly that Jefferson had failed the state in the revolution. When the state was threatened with war during the revolution, Jefferson was too busy planning the new capital at Richmond to really bother with preparing the defenses of the state. And at one point, Marshall and General Baron von Steuben went to Jefferson and pleaded with him for more money for the military to defend the state. And Jefferson said, no, you know, he didn't have any money and he was too busy. So as a result, the British invaded Virginia. They burned the new capital in Richmond. They even took Jefferson's home and Charlottesville. And Jefferson ran away. And many people felt that Jefferson had behaved cowardly. And Patrick Henry introduced a measure of censure against Jefferson for his behavior during the war. So I think that experience also shaped, to some extent, Marshall's deep resentment of Jefferson. And then Marshall went on to marry Polly Ambler, who was the daughter of the woman who Jefferson first fell in love with and had proposed marriage to, and she had refused Jefferson. And here's the daughter of this beautiful woman who now marries his poor cousin. Jefferson had a lot of grievances against Marshall, too. I have a question about biographers. When I read biographies of Thomas Jefferson and John Marshall, I can't help but read the biographers as carrying on the rivalry between their subjects. Biographies about Jefferson don't tend to portray Marshall in the most flattering light, and biographies about Marshall tend to cast Jefferson at worst as this villain-like figure or, at best, as an out-of-touch elite dreamer. And I wonder if this is something you've noticed too, and as a biographer, how does your work to tell the story of one person impact your ability to look at and depict the life and deeds of another figure like Thomas Jefferson? Well, I certainly plead guilty to the accusation that I have assumed, in some sense, Marshall's animosity or criticisms of Jefferson. I think it's quite natural that that happens because to write a biography, I spent seven years working on Marshall's letters, reading all of his letters, reading all of Jefferson's correspondence about Marshall. And you have to, I think, love your character. You have to, in some sense, fall in love with your character, hopefully see their flaws as well as their virtues. But that process of falling in love with your character means sort of taking on their side in a lot of issues. So I think that certainly explains for me identification with Marshall. If I didn't like Marshall, if I thought that Marshall were a terrible person and Jefferson was right, I think I would have a hard time living with him for seven years. Yeah. And it does seem as though many biographers do grow a sense of connection with the individual that they're studying and writing about. And I think this is a bit different for a historian. A historian who's working on a more traditional history book often seems to be able to keep more of a distance from the people that they're writing about. Do you find this to be true too, Joel? Do you think that there's something about biography that draws an author into their subject more than a historical subject can draw the historian in? I think that's an excellent question. And I think that if you are trying to tell the story from the perspective of one person, I think to write a good biographer, you have to see the world through their eyes. You have to be in their shoes. You have to occupy their space. And I certainly felt that way as I was writing my biography of Marshall. I mean, I've written history before about, for example, the development of certain legal doctrines or the establishment of the World Trade Organization. Those kinds of histories do allow me to have a certain objectivity because I'm not trying to see the world through the eyes of one individual. I think that's also one of the charms of biography. It's easier for readers, I think, 
to identify with an individual and an individual's experience than it is for them to identify with an idea or a social movement. To the extent that my ambition is to try to get people to think more and to be more aware of American history, I hope that my books have that effect, that people will feel drawn in by the personal stories to understanding more about political events. Now, to return back to Marshall's legal career, in his book, Without Precedent, Joel notes that the Marshall Court issued over 1,000 decisions, nearly all of them unanimous. And Marshall, he wrote nearly half of those majority opinions. And after we take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor, I'd like for Joel to take us through one of the Marshall Court's most famous unanimous decisions, Marbury versus Madison. This episode is brought to you by the Omohundro Institute proud publishers of award-winning books since 1943. Chief Justice John Marshall's impact on the structure and role of the Supreme Court was enormous. You might say his thoughts, decisions, and actions have affected us all. And thanks to our guest, Joel Richard Paul, and his biography Without Precedent, we have a better understanding of just how John Marshall came to the conclusions he did. Joel is fortunate. John Marshall left behind a lot of materials for his future biographers to study. But we're fortunate, too. For over 46 years, the Omohundro Institute, along with its partner institution, William & Mary, produced a meticulously edited collection of John Marshall's papers, his correspondence, his accounts, and his selected judicial opinions. In the end, the project reached 12 full volumes and now stands as the definitive collection of John Marshall's papers. Collections like these are invaluable for biographers and by extension for us, fans of history. If today's show has piqued your curiosity about John Marshall and you'd like to learn more about him, then consider purchasing one of these critically acclaimed volumes, or perhaps even the whole 12-volume set, from the OI's publishing partner, the University of North Carolina Press. Visit benfranklinsworld.com slash John Marshall to see these volumes. And thanks to the OI and UNC Press, Ben Franklin's World listeners can take a full 40% off the cost of any book by entering code 01BFW. So visit benfranklinsworld.com slash John Marshall and use promo code 01BFW. Joel, when many of us think about the Marshall Court, we often think of that 1803 unanimous decision in Marbury versus Madison. And Marcus and John would like to know more about this case and the Marshall Court's decision in it. So would you tell us about Marbury versus Madison and why historians and history books are always talking about this case? Well, you have to understand the political circumstances under which Marshall wrote that opinion in Marbury versus Madison. Jefferson is elected, and there's this fear that these Republicans who've taken over both houses of Congress, when I say Republicans, of course, I mean Jeffersonian Republicans, not the current Republican Party. The Republicans who've taken over Congress are out to rid themselves of these pesky Federalists in the judiciary. And they initiate a series of actions to impeach Federalist judges at the state and at the federal level, including one of Marshall's colleagues on the Supreme Court, Justice Samuel Chase. And in that sort of context, the Republicans repeal the Judiciary Act that had been passed in 1801 by the Federalist Congress, just as they were being kicked out of office which had established the circuit courts. So before then, there had been no circuit courts. They established the circuit courts so that the Supreme Court justices would not have to ride circuit any longer. Republicans in 1802 repeal the Circuit Court Act. They start these impeachments. There's all sorts of speeches by the president and by members of the Senate and the House that are very critical of the Federalists, the Federalist judges. And so the independence of the judiciary and the rule of law is threatened. William Marbury is a guy who had been given a commission as a justice of the peace. This was one of 42 justices of the peace that had been appointed by John Adams in the closing days of his administration as another way to sort of reward his political cronies and friends of the Federalists. William Marbury didn't get his commission because the last day of the Adams administration, the job of delivering these commissions had fallen to the Secretary of State, John Marshall, who at the time was serving both as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and also Secretary of State. And 
Secretary of State's job at the time was much, much bigger than the job of the Secretary of State is today. So he had his hands full and the commissions didn't get delivered. So the next day after Jefferson takes office, he goes into Marshall's office and he sees these commissions lying on Marshall's desk and he says, okay, I'm going to tell my Secretary of State, James Madison, not to deliver those commissions. So Madison refuses to deliver the commissions. William Marbury then decides he's going to file a suit in federal court to force James Madison to deliver his commission. Now, understand that William Marbury didn't need this job. The Justice of the Peace job didn't pay anything. William Marbury was a prominent man. He was the president of the first bank in the District of Columbia. He was simply doing this to annoy and embarrass the Jefferson administration. So he files this, what's called a writ of mandamus, an order from the court to get the Secretary of State, James Madison, to deliver his commission. That order gets filed in the Supreme Court. Everybody understands that if Marshall issues a decision saying James Madison has to deliver this commission, James Madison is not going to do it. James Madison thought so little of the Supreme Court, he didn't even bother showing up in the court while he was being sued. He didn't even send an attorney to represent him in the Supreme Court because the court had no authority at the time. So Marshall engineers this opinion in which he says, well, we think that the commission rightfully belongs to William Marbury. And the Secretary of State has a legal obligation to deliver that commission, and his failure to do so represents a violation of federal law. That's really significant. I mean, that is the court asserting for the first time its authority to sit in judgment on the acts of the executive branch. The court says, we can't order the Secretary of State to deliver the commission, however, because William Marbury filed his suit in the wrong court. He filed it in the Supreme Court, and he should have filed it in the lower court, in the Court of Appeals, because, the court goes on to say, the act of Congress, the 1789 Judiciary Act, that purported to give the Supreme Court authority to hear orders of writs of mandamus, is itself unconstitutional, that that section of the act violates Article 3 of the Constitution. Now, without getting into all of the legal particulars here, I can tell you that, first of all, there was no such conflict between Section 13 of the Judiciary Act of 1789 and Article 3 of the Constitution. Marshall manufactured that conflict. He invented that conflict by purposefully misreading what Section 13 of the 1789 Act says. He did that in order to establish a precedent for judicial review. So he creates this precedent that the court has the authority to strike down federal law when it interferes with the Constitution as a way of asserting the Supreme Court's power. But somewhat brilliantly, this is a strategic retreat. He doesn't directly confront the Jefferson administration because he doesn't order them to do something. In other words, the outcome of the case is Marbury doesn't get his commission. So there's no direct conflict between the Supreme Court and the president. But at the same time, he establishes this precedent that says we, the court, can sit in judgment on both the actions of the executive branch and the actions of the legislative branch. It's a brilliant decision. And that decision it helps to lift the court from a position of no authority to a co equal branch of the government. He gets all of the justices to sign on to one single opinion. It is an, a break with the traditions of Anglo-American law, because up until that time, judges wrote individual decisions. But Marshall was the person who thought, if the court is going to have authority as a co-equal branch of government, we have to issue a single decision. And it's better if that single decision is a unanimous decision. So he worked as chief justice to always try to cobble together a unanimous decision on the court. It meant making compromises. It meant being pragmatic. But those actions by Marshall are the reason that today we see the Supreme Court as so powerful and as a co-equal member of the federal government. You noted how Marshall once used the position of Secretary of State to get out of Congress, but from the way you just described how he got the court to issue this unanimous decision, 
It sounds like Marshall used a lot of his experience with congressional politicking on the court to get these decisions and compromises. Well, in a sense, that's right. You know, Marshall, his experience as a frontiersman, as a soldier, as an attorney, as well as as a legislator, had taught him to be a pragmatist, had taught him the value of compromise, of trying to work together with people across the aisle. And as a chief justice, he participated, as you said, in over 1,100 decisions, more than half of which he wrote himself, and all but 35 of those decisions were unanimous. That's extraordinary. No other judge in our history has come close to that kind of a record. And what makes it even more extraordinary is that every single member of the court who was appointed during John Marshall's 34 years on the court was appointed by a Republican president who swore that he was opposed to Marshall's jurisprudence and who appointed men who he thought would help reverse Marshall's jurisprudence. And instead, Marshall, through his intellect and his personal charisma, was able to win these men over and to always forge some kind of common ground. Now, I'm curious about Marshall the slaveholder, because when we write biographies about people who lived before 1865, one of the aspects of their life that we really have to grapple with is slavery. So what were Marshall's views on slavery and did his views pose any challenges for you as you tried to explain and interpret Marshall's life and work? Marshall did not have clean hands when it came to slavery. And this was one of the issues which I really had a hard time with. He owned 15 household slaves, but he was also an opponent of slavery. He worked, as I said, to try to liberalize the conditions for manumission in Virginia to allow more slaveholders to emancipate their slaves. He also believed that all persons, all free persons, should be citizens of the Commonwealth without regard for their race. As an attorney, he represented numerous slaves pro bono against their masters in various cases. He started the Virginia Colonization Society, which may seem illiberal to us today, but at the time, the notion was to create a homeland for emancipated African Americans so that they could return to Africa because Marshall thought that white Southerners would never accept Africans as their social equals. And so he tried to make that possible. As a slaveholder, Marshall always insisted that slaves should never be separated from their children. He never broke up slave families. He had a very close relationship with his valet named Robin Spurlock, who was sort of a confidant to Marshall and who managed Marshall's household during his long absences from his wife, who was herself an invalid. So I think, you know, his record in terms of his personal relations with slaves and slaveholding was better than some other slaveholders. But most importantly, as Chief Justice, Marshall worked to try to strengthen the capacity of the federal government to eventually regulate slavery out of existence. Marshall's famous decision in a case called Gibbons versus Ogden, which establishes the power of Congress to regulate commerce between the states was understood by everyone as a decision which threatened the institution of slavery. Southerners were outraged by that decision and also by Marshall's decision in McCulloch versus Maryland, the case that upheld the authority of Congress to establish a national bank, because those two cases basically represented the idea that Congress could do pretty much anything it wanted to do when it came to regulating the economy. And so if Congress decided at some point in the future that they wanted to take steps to put slavery out of business, they could do so. It also meant that the federal government was committed to creating greater integration among the states, trying to build a national economy. Marshall understood that as commerce and industry and urbanization increased, that the agrarian slave-based economy of the South would crumble. And that's what he hoped to accomplish. Now, as biographies are about people, and you connected with Marshall, you now know many of the intimate details of his life. I wonder, did you ever feel any pressure or desire to try and connect with and research the enslaved people that Marshall had working in his household or out on his plantations? I spent a lot of time trying to track that down. And unfortunately, I was unable to do so. I could find no records. And if 
if anyone has any records with regard to that and would like to bring them to my attention, I would be most grateful. Something that's come up throughout our conversation and something that came up at the start of Joel's book, Without Precedent, is the idea that John Marshall transformed what was an insignificant, impotent judiciary into a powerful co-equal branch of the federal government. And before we go into the time warp, Joel, how do you think Marshall was able to accomplish this feat? How did he transform the Supreme Court and the judicial branch into a powerful co-equal branch of government? Well, he accomplished this by creating an environment in which the court spoke with one voice. He insisted, for example, that the judges all had to live together in the same boarding house. They took all of their meals together. They lived together that way for most of 34 years. It's unthinkable today, of course, but of course, then Washington was a much smaller place. And that sort of personal interaction among the judges helped to create a kind of brotherhood. Marshall knew that if he didn't have a majority on his side, he could still write the opinion for the other side, but he would write it in ways that was less problematic for him. So he would always insist on writing these unanimous decisions, but he would write them in ways that was most favorable to his position. So he would narrow decisions for example, on slave issues or with regard to the Indians that would otherwise perhaps establish precedents that Marshall did not want to establish. And Marshall, by speaking with one voice, he was able to create this sense of mystique, of authority that the court had, where they were able to sort of capture the public's attention. So, decisions of the court began to get reported in the newspapers and arguments before the court were reported sometimes in great detail in newspapers throughout the country. The people who argued before John Marshall included people like Daniel Webster, one of the great advocates of his day. And I think to some extent, the quality of the arguments improved. And as the quality of the arguments improved, it became more of a spectator sport coming in and seeing what was going on in the court and reporting on it. And this, over time, changed the perception of the court, both by the political elite as well as by the public. So I guess when we say that John Marshall helped transform the Supreme Court, it's not just that he helped increase the judicial branch's prestige, it's that he was writing these majority opinions and skewing the outlook of the judicial branch toward his own political and judicial views, which is really a personal imprint. I mean, he left a personal imprint, if you will, on the Supreme Court. Absolutely, yes. Now we should jump into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if John Jay had agreed to President John Adams' request to return to the chief justiceship of the Supreme Court? What would have happened to the Supreme Court and to the development of the judicial branch if John Marshall had never served as chief justice? Well, that's an excellent question and actually a very frightening question. There's two ways to answer it. John Jay had been Chief Justice of the Supreme Court under George Washington. So we know something about what his leadership would have meant. Though he was a good attorney, John Jay did not have the personality or the political astuteness to be able to craft the kinds of decisions that Marshall crafted and to be able to bring the court together and to speak with one voice. It didn't occur to him, for example, that it would be useful to have the court speak with one voice. Under John Jay, they followed pretty much the British model of the judges each issuing their own decisions. And Jay was himself a very controversial figure. He had, of course, negotiated Jay's treaty, which was seen by many people as the Federalists kowtowing to the British. And I suspect that if Jay had been Chief Justice, the court would have been under no less pressure from the Republicans, but they would not have had the political will to resist. And so I think the court would have become really weak 
Jefferson, for example, suggested that he should have the authority to hire and fire justices at will, that he shouldn't have to go through an impeachment that he wanted to, he could just fire a judge. If that had happened, of course, the Supreme Court today would not only be seen as a weak tool of the president, but the rule of law itself would be threatened. For those people who are concerned about present events taking place in Washington, D.C., imagine what the world would have looked like under those circumstances. The other way to answer the question is to say that when Marshall left the Supreme Court, Justice Taney took over, and Justice Taney used the instruments and the authority that Marshall had created during his 34 years as Chief Justice for rendering the decision in Dred Scott that led to civil war, because Taney did not have the same, I think, judgment that Marshall had in trying to avoid taking on controversies head on. Marshall was always able to sort of take controversies strategically in ways that were largely able to neutralize them. Taney, by deciding in Dred Scott that African Americans were not citizens and that the federal Congress could not take away a man's property, which included his slaves, those decisions really led us into the Civil War. So I think that without Marshall on the court, it would have been a catastrophe for the rule of law in this country. So Joel, who comes after John Marshall? Are you working on another biography? Well, right now I'm writing a book about Daniel Webster. He, of course, is a character in my book on John Marshall because Daniel Webster was such a prominent attorney during the period of the Marshall Court. He argued the Dartmouth College case, McCulloch versus Maryland, Gibbons versus Ogden, and other cases. And Webster is a fascinating figure. He hasn't been written about very much, but he had an enormous influence on our international relations because in addition to being a senator, a member of Congress, and a famous constitutional advocate, he was also the Secretary of State under three presidents. So uh, I'm really enjoying getting into his life. Now, we've explored many of the details relating to Marshall's life, and you wrote a really big biography, so we couldn't cover all the details you have in that book in our time together. So is there a way to contact you if we have more questions about Marshall or any of his legal decisions? Well, the best way to reach me is on my website, which is joelrichardpaul.com. I'm happy to respond to people's emails from joelrichardpaul.com. I also have a Twitter account, which is at Joel Richard Paul. And I teach at the University of California, Hastings College of the Law, and people are also welcome to contact me there. Joel Richard Paul, thank you for taking us through some of the particulars of John Marshall's life today and for helping us better understand your work as a biographer. It's been a great pleasure. I'm a huge fan of your program. It is also not entirely unworthy of observation that in declaring what shall be the supreme law of the land, the Constitution itself is first mentioned, and not the laws of the United States generally, but those only which shall be made in pursuance of the Constitution have that rank. Thus, the particular phraseology of the Constitution of the United States confirms and strengthens that principle supposed to be essential to all written constitutions, that a law repugnant to the Constitution is void, and that courts, as well as other departments, are bound by that instrument. The rule must be discharged. After 30 years of teaching international and constitutional law, Joel Richard Paul wanted to better understand how John Marshall came to have such an impact on the development of the United States and its legal system. To understand Marshall's influence, Joel needed context for Marshall's life and work. He needed to know about the forces, people, and events that shaped Marshall. This is why he spent seven years researching and writing a comprehensive biography about Marshall's life that takes us through Marshall's childhood in the Virginia frontier, his military service in the Revolutionary War, and the circumstances of his legal and political work as a practicing lawyer, politician, and statesman. These were all forces that shaped John Marshall's life and mine, before he became the fourth Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court in 1801. Now, Joel could have written a traditional history book about the influences that shaped John Marshall, but he chose to research and write a biography. Because like Flora Frazier, Scott Casper, and Annette Gordon-Reed in episode 209, 
Joel C.'s biography is a genre about people, and stories about people help us better understand the past because of their natural narrative arc and because they invite us to relate to and empathize with their subjects. One of Joel's goals for his biography was to entice and invite people to explore United States law and legal history. Now, these can sound like dry subjects to many of us, but when explored through the life of someone like John Marshall, we not only become interested in these subjects, we can better appreciate their importance in development. Now, you may recall from episode 209 how Scott Casper advised us that the purpose of biography today is to show us a person's goals and how they failed or succeeded in achieving those goals. And Joel helped us do just that in our conversation and in his biography without precedent. One of Joel's main goals for his biography was to show us how Marshall mastered the art of self-invention and applied it to everything he did. And we can see how Marshall acquired this art from Joel's description of Marshall's boyhood in the rural Virginia frontier. And we can see how he used this art in the way that Marshall seized the opportunity to advance from a common soldier to an officer in the 3rd Virginia Regiment or in the many ways that Marshall tried to fashion himself into a proper gentleman to win the heart and approval of Polly Ambler and her family. Now, Joel also sees this art of self-invention as playing a pivotal role in the way that Marshall approached politics and his work as Chief Justice. Marshall's wartime experiences shaped him. His military service taught him the value of peace and the need for a strong national government. Marshall was a nationalist, and he acted in ways that worked toward his nationalist vision for the United States. Now, Joel presented us with many examples on this point, and one of the clearest examples was Marshall's opinion in Marbury versus Madison. In this 1803 case, Marshall needed to act within the context that he represented a thus far underdeveloped branch of the federal government, at a time when both the Jeffersonian-led executive and legislative branches were repealing the Judiciary Acts and impeaching judges like Justice Samuel Chase. In order to assert the power of the judicial branch, which Marshall foresaw as a powerful, co-equal branch of government, he manufactured a precedent to rule that the Supreme Court had the power to strike down a federal law when it violated the Constitution and to sit in judgment over both the executive and legislative branches. And Marshall's ruling reflects this in that the court sat in judgment over the executive branch when it ruled that Marbury was owed his commission, but the court couldn't force the executive branch to deliver the commission because Marbury had violated judicial procedure by filing his suit in the wrong court. Now, that's just one example of where Marshall succeeded in self-invention. In the case of slavery, it may appear that he fell short. As Joel related, Marshall's hands weren't clean when it came to slavery. Although Marshall tried to liberalize many mission conditions and gain citizenship for free blacks in Virginia, represented enslaved men and women against their owners in court, and tried to fix the problem of slavery with his work with the Virginia Colonization Society and in his 1824 ruling in Gibbons v. Ogden, Marshall was a slaveholder and he held complicated views about slavery. Now, one example that Joel raised in his biography without precedent that we just didn't have a chance to talk about today was Marshall's relationship with his personal servant, Robin Spurlock. Between pages 45 and 53, Joel details much of the work that Marshall did to challenge and end slavery. He also confronts how Marshall had a close relationship with Spurlock. But although Marshall often seemed to treat Spurlock in ways that we might even see as equal, Joel reminds us that Marshall was not free of racial prejudice. Marshall upheld the right to own slaves in slave states in his judicial opinions, and in his will, Marshall agreed to manumit Spurlock only if he resettled in Liberia. Faced with a choice of leaving his friends, family, and home, or obtaining his freedom in Africa, Spurlock chose to remain enslaved and went to live with Marshall's daughter. People are complicated, and a good biographer should help us grapple with the complicated. They should also help us understand how people are products of the time and place in which they lived. Because time, place, and circumstances form the context that we need in order to better understand how and why people acted as they did. You can find more information about Joel, his biography without precedent, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 210. If you haven't yet heard episode 209, you should check it out as we'll be continuing our exploration of biography as a genre next week when Richard Brookheiser will take us through his new biography of John Marshall. And in two weeks, we'll conclude the Doing History biography series by exploring the life of Ona Judge, Georgia Martha Washington's escaped slave, and how her biographer, Erica Dunbar, worked to uncover her story. My Omahundro Institute Digital Projects team teammates, Joseph Edelman, Holly White, and Kim Foley, have prepared some great resources about biography in the OI Reader app. 
The app is free and can be downloaded on any iOS or Android device. For more details, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash oireader. If today's episode piqued your curiosity about John Marshall, you should consider purchasing one of the critically acclaimed volumes of his papers, or perhaps even the whole 12-volume set. Visit benfranklinsworld.com slash John Marshall and use promo code 01BFW to save 40% off any title. Again, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash John Marshall and use promo code 01BFW. Throughout this episode, you heard excerpts of John Marshall's majority opinion in Marbury vs. Madison. The part of John Marshall was played by Joel Sharpton, the proprietor of Pro Podcasting Services and the host of the personal storytelling podcast, What Makes Me Weird. I've included links for Joel and his podcast in the show notes. Finally, if you could research and write a biography about someone, who would you research and write about? I'm curious, so let me know. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.